Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Um, I'm very happy that um, uh, to present Susie Brown, who's a PhD student at Warwick with uh, Adam Johansson and Jerry Koskela. And she's going to tell us about asymptotic genealogies of sequential Monte Carlo uh, algorithms. So please, Susie, go ahead. Um, thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me a uh, very long time ago, Yuri. Um, <laughs> Uh, so this is joint work with my supervisors, Paul Adam and Yeri. Um, so just a quick outline. So I'll introduce very briefly sequential Monte Carlo and talk about resampling and how that um, causes degeneracy and what we might do about it. And then I'll present our results about genealogies of SMC algorithms and then illustrate that with some examples. Um, so I'm kind of assuming I don't need to motivate SMC with this audience. So my one sentence introduction is that we want to approximate a sequence of distributions by simulating a population of particles evolving in time. Um, and we're going to use these, iterate these three steps. So uh, at time t, we have a, a transition kernel, which we assume has a density qt, um, which we mutate the particles. And then we weight them by a potential function, potential function gt, and then resample in proportion to the weights. Um, so we're assuming everything has densities just for the purpose of this talk. Um, the the step that I'm we'll come back to the Q and uh, G later, but the part that I'm really interested in is the resampling because that's what intro introduces the genealogies. Um, OK, so the, the problem with resampling is basically we have N capital N particles and they have these weights which are continuous and exist on the simplex. So something like this. Um, and we want to transform them to discrete offspring counts. Um, so how can we do that? Um, there are lots of different ways, but the what I'm going to take to be like valid resampling schemes will be ones with these properties. So um, I want the number of particles to be constant. So we always resample n particles again. Um, the the particles should be equally weighted just after resampling. We reset the weights to one over n. And the resampling should be unbiased. So given the weights, the offspring counts um, in expectation should be n times the weight. Um, so all of these can be broken, have been broken in the literature. So um, but I don't think they're particularly unreasonable conditions. So um, like for the number of particles constant, I mean, you can change the number of particles at each iteration, but if you have limited computational resources, it kind of makes sense that you want to do the maximum number of particles you can at every step. So we'll call that N. Um, there are some examples of uh, resampling, like I think Liu and Chen resampled with the square roots and then um, compensated by having uh, different weights after resampling, but there aren't a lot of examples in the literature of things like that. And then um, unbiasedness is a really nice property, although uh, one of my fellow Oxfos people uh, I know is working on a differentiable scheme where they use option, uh, optimal transport to resample, which is deterministic, so it's of course biased. Um, but yeah, I think in general, these properties cover most of the resampling schemes that are used in the literature. Um, OK, so then where do the genealogies come from? So um, suppose like this is one iteration. So we have n equals four particles and we resample. So like this one has one offspring, this has none and this one has two, etc. Um, so we get these parent offspring relationships. And then if we do a few more iterations, we might have something like this. Um, and we can trace back the lineage of one of the terminal particles. So like this one, this is what we will call its lineage, which is like the whole sequence of parent offspring relationships for that particle. And then we can also trace all the other lineages of the four terminal particles. Um, and the important thing is that they overlap and the whole um, this whole sort of red highlighted branching process is what we call the genealogy. Um, and this is important in SMC because um, we have this problem of ancestral degeneracy, which means that if we go far enough back in time, there aren't many distinct samples available because these like black particles have been killed and are therefore not part of our sample. Um, and the genealogy is interesting because it 
directly encodes this ancestral degeneracy phenomenon. Um, so there are a few things we can do to um, try and mitigate this problem. So I'll just go through a few of them. So um, one idea might be we could resample less often, and this is the idea behind um, adaptive resampling, which typically means um, we use the effective sample size, which is a function of the weights, and when it falls below some threshold, say n over two, then we resample, and the rest of the time we don't resample. So, like in this sort of schematic, this at this step and at this step, we didn't do any resampling. So each particle just had one offspring, um, and you can kind of see from this very made up diagram that uh, like we it it improves things a bit because we don't resample as often we don't get as many coalescences so we have still got two lineages for instance at this end um there are some like alternative ways to do adaptive resampling which i won't go into but you can use the sort of uh, entropy instead of effective sample size and things like that um if your proposals are good then typically the adaptive resampling will reduce the amount of times you resample a lot because the weights don't degenerate as fast, so you don't um, have to resample very often. Um, but if you have quite bad proposals, like if you have like a difficult model, you might find that you resample pretty much every time anyway. Um, OK, so another thing we could do is resample more cleverly. So this is um, what I'm going to call low variance resampling. So essentially, we're trying to make the resampling procedure less random. Um, so like in this uh, schematic, we are resampling at every step, but we're not um, introducing as many coalescences because a lot of the particles are having a fewer number of offspring, which is kind of kind of resembles what would happen with low variance resampling. Um, and basically the idea here is like you avoid things like behavior that you wouldn't want, such as low weight particles having lots of offspring just because of random chance. Um, so you reduce the randomness a bit and get something that behaves better. Um, and you can also combine this with adaptive resampling. So you resample only sometimes, and when you do, you use low variance resampling. So I'll come back to this a bit later. Um, one more thing is we could try and make use of the killed samples. So this is kind of the idea behind backward simulation. Uh, which is sort of a completely different thing because we run this forward algorithm in the same way, but then we run a backwards pass to resample, uh, to sample like the lineage is completely new. So I've sort of tried to represent this with like these dotted arrows being backwards sample sampling. Although this isn't a very good representation of how the algorithm actually works, but it gives you an idea of how we end up using more of the killed samples um, in our final uh, approximation. Um, but backward simulation is not always available and it's computationally expensive. So I'm not going to talk about it in this talk because in fact we don't even get a genealogy in this case. So it's not very interesting to this particular work. Um, so we're supposing we're in a case where we can't use backward simulation. Maybe we can do some of the other things that I've suggested, but we still have some ancestral degeneracy. We can't completely get rid of it. So it might be interesting to quantify how much. Um, so this is so we might be able to answer questions like these ones. So uh, suppose I've got a time horizon T and I want to have a high probability of keeping K trajectories across the whole time horizon. How many particles should I use? Um, if you're doing fixed lag smoothing, you can tune the lag. So you might want to tune it so that you don't get um, too much degeneracy. Um, or you might just want to get an idea of how reliable your estimator is, given that you have n particles and time horizon t. And then another thing is you could um, use this to compare resampling schemes directly in terms of the ancest ancestral degeneracy. Um, so we need a way to analyze genealogies. So we need a way to encode them. So um, if I go back to the sort of vanilla um, example from earlier and we strip this down to just the genealogy so just the information we need which is basically uh, the times at which coalescences occurred and the topology of the genealogical tree so we get something like this um, and then 
I mean, this is all very well, but this still isn't really encoded in a useful way. So we're going to write this in terms of a stochastic process uh, like this. So first of all, we're going to label time in reverse because the coalescent process that we'll be looking at is a backwards in time process. So this turns out to be convenient. So we're just making the terminal particles at time zero and then time one, two, three goes backwards in time. And then um, we assume that we have uh, capital M particles, but we're only going to sample uh, little n of them because in the end we're going to take capital N to infinity and we want to look at a finite dimensional object. So we're taking a random sample of small n particles. So then we can construct this stochastic process G, which will describe the genealogy. So it takes values on the space of partitions of one to little n. Um, and it's defined so that I and J are in the same block of GT, if and only if particles I and J at the um, terminal time share the common a common ancestor at time T. So this completely encodes the genealogy. And um, what we end up with is something with these properties. So we start off at the terminal time G0 with the partition made up of singletons because all the lineages are separate at the at the um, at time zero. Um, the only possible transitions are ones that merge blocks because every time we have a coalescent, that's just some blocks merging. And that means that once we reach the trivial partition where there's only one block, we can't do any further coalescence. So that's an absorbing state. Um, so just to give a concrete example of this, if we go back to this one that I had, and for this example, I'm taking little n equals capital N equals four. So I've labeled the um, terminal particles. So now we can construct the process G. So at time t equals zero, these will be the uh, blocks of the partition. So that it's just the singletons, as I said. But then if we go back one more step, then uh, lines three and four have merged now. So we've got three and four in the single block. And then, and so on, we merge in two as well. And then finally, at some point we reach this uh, fully coalesced absorbing state. Um, so we're, when we take capital N to infinity, what we're gonna we're gonna look at the asymptotic sort of um, process. So we're gonna take a scaling of the process G, um, and it turns out we're gonna end up with an object called Kingman's N coalescent, which I'll just introduce now. So um, this is a, like a canonical model in population genetics, which is for I think obvious reasons quite related to our SMC genealogies. Um, it's a continuous time mark of chain on the space of partitions of one to little n. And um, the coalescence events are encoded by pair mergers. So you, the only thing that can happen is two lineages can merge into one, which is what you see at these sort of branching points on this diagram. Um, and each pair is merging independently at rate one which means that while you have k lineages in the population, the total merger rate is k choose two, which is why you have like loads of mergers happening at this part of the tree. And then like not so many as you go further up because there aren't as many lineages around. Um, and this is a really nice object because it's like basically totally tractable. We know about the distributions of all sorts of properties of it, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Um, but it's worth noticing that it, doesn't sound a lot like our um, genealogical process from our SMC algorithm. Um, first of all, it's in continuous time, which our SMC definitely isn't. Um, our SMC genealogies are not even Markov because we've um, basically thrown away information about the states, which breaks the Markov property, because we're, we're only focusing on the um, ancestral information. Um, we, we have the right state space, that's good. Um, and also we definitely aren't restricted to single pair mergers in SMC because uh, one parent can obviously be resampled and have more than two offspring and also it's very common to have two different parents have um, more than one offspring in at the same generation which is also not allowed in the Kingman's coalescent. Um, and the pair merger rate is probably not correct but we're going to uh, correct for that in the next slide. So. Um, 
so we need to introduce this object cn. So this the interpretation of this is that it's um, conditional on nu t, which is the offspring counts. Uh, it's the probability that a randomly chosen pair um, of lineages from our sample has the same um, parent one generation back. Um, so the, this n brackets two is denoting a falling factorial. So this is n times n minus one. Um, so one over n n minus one is the total number of pairs that there could be. Um, and then this new two is um, again a falling factorial, and this is the number of pairs among the offspring of parent i. So if you sort of squint at it and think about it for a bit, you can see that this is the the probability of a randomly chosen pair uh, merging one generation back. Or you can take my word for it. Um, and this probability converges to in the limit, it becomes the um, pair merger rate. So um, that means that if we want to get possibly get a Kingman coalescent limit, we need the rate, the pair merger rate to be one. So all we're going to do is transform time um, by rescaling by this quantity tau n, which is kind of a generalized inverse of Cn. Um, so what this does is it maps the continuous time t onto a discrete time s um, so in a way that accounts for, like uh, makes up for the um, extra for the merger rate Cn and sets it back to one. Um, so this is basically the link between our discrete SMC generations and the continuous Kingman limit. Um, so what we'll see in a minute is that once we've done this scaling, uh, if we have some other conditions satisfied, then we will get convergence to the end coalescent. So um, this is our main result. So I'll just go through the conditions. So the first one is that um, parent offspring uniform conditional on offspring counts. Um, which is not a big assumption because although your resampling scheme might not satisfy this, depending on how it's implemented, you can always enforce it by just applying a permutation to the um, offspring indices after resampling. And the role this plays in the limit is it's sort of related to the exchangeability in Kingman's coalescent. But this is uh, weaker than exchangeability for our model. Um, we also have to assume that the time scale doesn't explode. So um, this is also a really mild condition because um, basically if this is uh, violated, it means that we have no coalescences ever, um, which is only ever going to happen if you have like constant potentials and you use minimum variance resampling, which is would require like such a well behaved model that it's never going to happen in reality. Um, and then, so the main condition is this one. So I'll just unpack this. So um, this quantity on the right here is um, the expectation of Cn. So this is telling us about um, the rate of pair mergers. The expectation sub t is a filtered expectation with respect to the backwards in time filtration, which uh, the upshot of which is that we can actually calculate this expectation. Um, Apart from that, you don't need to worry about it. Uh, then we've got this sequence Vn, which converges to zero. And on the left hand side, we have something similar, except now we have the third order falling factorials. And the interpretation is that where we had pair mergers on the right, these are like triple mergers. So essentially what this is saying is that the triple mergers are going to vanish in the limit because Vn is going to zero and that they're always dominated uh, by the pair mergers. So this is how we get rid of those pesky uh, multiple mergers that aren't allowed in the Kingman limit. Um, so yeah, this might sound a bit like an unrealistic condition, but we'll show that it um, can happen in some quite normal examples. So the consequence of all this is what you expect is that we have once we rescale the genealogies, we take capital N to infinity, then we get convergence to Kingman's coalescent in the sense of finite dimensional distributions. 
Um, so, what, what do I want to say? Yeah, so this is our theorem, which is all very nice and abstract, uh, but we can also apply this to some practical examples. So I will go through a few. So we've verified the theorem in these cases. So the first one's the, the obvious multinomial resampling, and then stochastic rounding in conditional SMC, I'll talk a bit more about in a bit. So, um, right, yeah, our first one is multinomial resampling, which is the nice, tractable, easy to analyze uh, one that we love to look at when we're analyzing SMC theoretically. Um, but we also know that it doesn't perform very well in practice. So one would hope that not too many people are using this in practice, although they probably are. Um, so how it works is we resample the parent indices from a categorical distribution, which means the offspring counts turn out to be multinomial uh, parameterized by the weights. Um, and then we need these additional conditions, which are strong mixing conditions for sequential Monte Carlo, which are saying that the potentials and the transition densities are all bounded above and below, which is a very strong condition, but it is like quite a standard condition in the SMC literature um, because it reduces the complications of proving things quite a lot. Um, so under these conditions, we have that the convergence um, holds, so we can verify the conditions of the theorem. Um, and I've put a link to this paper because this was already proved uh, by some of our Warwick colleagues. Um, but the proof is now more elegant because we've simplified the conditions of the theorem since then. Uh, okay, so the next example I have to introduce stochastic rounding. So I'm going to define it like this. So why is a stochastic rounding of X if all of the marginals are of this form? So conditional on X, um, Y either rounds down or rounds up with certain probabilities. And the probabilities are such that if um, XI is close to the floor of XI, for instance, it's more likely to round down. Um, and we can use this to, to construct a resampling scheme um, if we take xi is equal to n times the ith weight and then yi will be our ith offspring count because by the construction of the stochastic rounding we have the expectation of y given x is xi which is the unbiasedness property that we wanted for our resampling scheme but we also require the other constraint which is that we want the number of particles to be constant so we need to constrain such that the sum of the y's is n, which turns out to be the tricky part. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to do it, which uh, gives rise to lots of different resampling schemes that are used in the literature. Um, so some examples of these are systematic resampling, residual resampling with stratified residuals, uh, the branching system resampling of Chris and Lyons, and um, SSP resampling from Gerber, Chopin and Whiteley. Um, and all of these are what we call minimum variance schemes, because basically you can't do better than, in terms of the marginal distributions, you can't do better than this, because if you want it to be unbiased, then like having only two, two possible options, like rounding up or rounding down is the best you can do. Um, okay, so now uh, it turns out our result applies to stochastic rounding. So here we go. We're resampling using any stochastic rounding. Um, and it's kind of nice because we can treat them all the same, which actually I'll just say a bit more about that. So because um, these are all defined. Uh, oh, actually, let's go back to this. Yes. Yeah, so our condition here only depends on um, like pure moments of the offspring count. So there aren't any mixed moments, which means that um, because our stochastic rounding is, det is defined by these um, marginals that are always the same for all of these resampling schemes, it means that we can like deal with the whole class of them in one fell swoop because we only need to worry about these marginals when we're verifying the conditions. So 
Um, then we need some conditions on the potentials and the transition densities again. Um, this is actually a little bit stronger than what we had for the multinomial resampling because we're now uniform in X prime as well for the Qs. Um, and then we get that the genealogies converge to the N coalescent. Um, in fact, we believe that we don't need the condition on Q because um, we in the proof we only use this to show that the time scale didn't explode and there's probably a different way to do that, but it was a convenient tool at the time. Um, and we only recently realised we could relax that, so we haven't figured it all out yet. <laughs> OK, so the last example is conditional SMC, which I will put into context a bit by a little venture into MCMC and particle Gibbs. So the sort of scenario to think about here is um, well, we want to use an MCMC -MC algorithm to target uh, a state space model, which is parameterized by theta. So our target distribution is um, P of theta and uh, the whole whole um, series of hidden states, uh, given the observations Y. Um, so an idea for how we could do this would be to use a Gibbs sampler. So we just alternate sampling theta given x and y and sampling x given theta and y. And I've said the first one of these is easy because in a lot of scenarios, you can do do your sort of basic Metropolis Hastings type algorithm to, to do this step. Um, this second step is the difficult one because um, this is a high dimensional posterior, which means um, MCMC is not well suited to it. So what we can do instead is use SMC, which is perfectly suited for sampling this type of posterior. Um, the only problem is that if we just stick in a standard SMC update for this step, we don't target the correct distribution. So what we have to do instead is what we call conditional SMC updates. So we condition on the trajectory of X's that we sampled at the previous Gibbs iteration. So we are conditioning on the states and the like um, ancestral indices for that um, single trajectory from the that we sampled at the last iteration of the Gibbs sampler. Um, I'll hopefully this will become a bit clearer. And what this means for resampling is that we have this, what I'll call the immortal lineage, which is this um, trajectory that we've conditioned on. If we consider just a, sing a single iteration of the um, Gibbs sampler, then the resampling step of the SMC update has to deterministically propagate the immortal lineage that it's given as an input. Um, so, so this, let's say, it looks a bit like this. So we're given this red lineage. This is our immortal lineage. And then we go and use our SMC, conditional SMC, to sample a load more lineages, which would be these black ones, um, which contain the immortal one. Um, so this is um, fine, because then after we've sampled all of these, in um, for, because it's part of the um, Gibbs sampler, what we do next is we sample one of these lineages, uh, one of these trajectories that we've sampled. So we just sample one according to their weights. Um, so we might sample like this one, or we might sample this one, for instance, and then we feed that in as the next iteration of the Gibbs sampler. Um, so if it looks like that, everything's fine. But if it looks more like this, we have a bit of a problem because um, basically what's happened here is all of the um, the SMC has like coalesced. So we've got quite bad ancestral degeneracy in this example, which means they've all coalesced. And because there's an immortal line, they've all had to coalesce onto the immortal line that they couldn't have all coalesced on somewhere else because the immortal line has to be there. Um, so what happens here is when we go to sample um, 
one of these trajectories, we're always sampling this part of the immortal lineage, and then maybe we sample something else afterwards. But that means that all of this part, which could be like states x0 up to some little t, are not being refreshed. So this is um, making meaning that the Gibbs sampler is not mixing at all on those states because then when we go into the next iteration, we still are fed in this as the immortal, as part of the immortal lineage, and then we're going to have the same problem again if they all coalesce again. So in the context of particle Gibbs, it's really important that we keep at least two distinct lineages across the whole time horizon, kind of more like in this example where we've got this one and this one are completely um, distinct. Um, so this is actually a particularly important application of this genealogy stuff. Um, but the other thing is that compared to just doing a normal SMC algorithm, this does make quite a significant difference to resampling because we're propagating, we're treating one lineage differently to all the others and propagating it deterministically. Um, so this could in theory, make quite a big difference to the genealogies, right? Like, as you can see here, they all had to coalesce onto that one. So that was quite a big change. So, um, but I can tell you that, in fact, we still get the same convergence result. Um, so we only looked at conditional SMC with multinomial resampling. It is possible to implement it with low variance resampling. And I feel safe to conjecture that it, the result would still work. Um, but it's quite fiddly to write down. Um, so we assume the same conditions that we had in the case of multinomial resampling for obvious reasons. And then we get our result as usual that we converge to the n coalescent. So it turns out that this immortal trajectory hasn't made a dif any difference in the limit. Um, and I think the intuition behind that is that we have capital N particles that's going to infinity and there's only ever one immortal lineage. So the probability of sampling the immortal lineage among your sample of little n among n um, particles is vanishing. It's like order one on capital N. Um, OK, so these are our three examples. Um, how is this all useful in practice would be a good question. So I said before that the Kingman Kerr lesson is really nice and tractable. So here are some things that we know about for the Kingman Kerr lesson. So obviously in, in the sense of probability distributions, because this is a random object. So the time to the most recent common ancestor is what is called in genetics. Um, and in the in terms of our SMC algorithm, this is the first time when there's when we go back in time, when we reach a point where there's only one distinct lineage. So you can see why this could be quite useful. For instance, if we we're in like the particle Gibbs setting and we wanted to make sure we always had two lineages, we'd want to stop the time horizon before this time to MRCA. Um, similarly, we can do uh, TK being the time interval um, over which there are exactly k lineages. So for instance, like t2 would be from here to here on this picture, and t3 would be from here to here. Um, so we know the distribution of that for every k. Um, and we also have the distribution of the total branch length, which in the case of SMC is really related to the storage cost. Because if you have um, the and if you have ancestral degeneracy, it actually reduces the amount of storage cost of the SMC algorithm because uh, once two lineages coalesce, you only need to store the remaining states once for the two of them, for instance. Um, and there was some, there have been some um, results in the literature about that sort of thing, like um, there was one by Jacob Murray and Ruben Thaler in 2014 where they talked about the amount of memory needed to store the paths. Um, so that's related to this total branch length, which for the Kingman Kerr lesson, we know the distribution of. Um, the trouble with applying all this to our SMC algorithms is that 
um, we don't have a standard Kingman coalescent as our limiting object. We have a time scaled one and typically we can't approximate the time scale. We don't know or we don't know how to approximate the time scale, um, which the tau n, which depends on um, the observed offspring count. So basically we don't know the time scale for the king, the limiting object until we've run the algorithm and observed it, by which point we've already observed all of these things anyway. Um, so that's kind of an issue and uh, definitely an avenue for future research. Um, just before I wrap up, I'll just um, zip back to the mitigating measures I talked about before. So um, the First of all, I talked about adaptive resampling. So my conjecture for the effect of that is that it should slow down the time scale on which the coalescent is recovered um, because you're resampling less often. So you should have coalescences less often. Um, but I'm not entirely sure about that because also you have a sort of balancing effect that when you resample, it's when the weights are really bad, which means you'll get more coalescences. Um, so it'd be interesting to know how that actually turns out. Um, low variance resampling, I feel I can say we have covered pretty well because um, stochastic rounding schemes were minimal variance resampling schemes. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we've done multinomial resampling, which is, I don't know if it's the worst possible, but it's like very high variance resampling scheme. Maybe you could construct something worse if you really wanted to. Um, so uh, both of, in both of these cases, we got the same limit. The only thing is that when we had, we used the stochastic rounding schemes, we got a slower time scale, which I didn't actually present here, but that is the case, um, which is what you'd expect. So it means that the co like fewer coalescences are happening, basically. Um, yeah, so I feel like I can put a tick next to that one. Um, and the last one was backward simulation, which, as I said, isn't really within the scope of this work because we don't even end up with a coalescent because we are just sampling um, the lineages backwards independently. So they don't necessarily like coalesce. They can sort of meet and then branch off again, for instance. Um, so you don't end up with a genealogy. Uh, OK, so to conclude, um, we know that SMC algorithms suffer from ancestral degeneracy and genealogies can help us to directly analyze that phenomenon, uh, which could give us uh, information about the performance of SMC algorithms before we before running them. Um, and we've pre uh, we've got some simple conditions under which these genealogies converge to the end coalescent, which is a nice tractable object that we can find out lots of things about. And um, furthermore, we've managed to verify this convergence in several important cases of SMC algorithms. Um, so some future work would be um, moving from finite dimensional distributions to weak convergence, which would allow us to say a bit more about expectations of test functions, which we're usually interested in in Monte Carlo methods. Um, and this is a work in progress. Um, different resampling schemes, so sort of in between the, the ends of the spectrum of multinomial resampling and um, minimal variance resampling. We have some other ones like stratified resampling, residual resampling of multinomial residuals, which sort of fall in between those. And it would be kind of nice to have the result for those as well, because they're quite used in practice as well, I think. Um, it would be nice to have a, to actually rigorously work out the effect of adaptive resampling. Um, and the well, the most important thing would be a substantial extra work, I think, but it would be really great if we could find a way of estimating tau n a priori, at least in some classes of models. Because um, as I said, this depends on the observed offspring counts, which means we can't really get a handle on our time scale until after we've run the algorithm. All we can do is compare the time scale between different algorithms. Um, and then, all of our results so far have been asymptotic, um, but particularly in the case of conditional SMC, it would be interesting to look at the finite M behaviour because, as I said, the basically 
the quirk about conditional SMC of this immortal lineage um, just vanishes in the limit. So, but it might have quite an effect in for finite n. So there could be some quite different results if you didn't look at the asymptotics. Obviously, that's quite a lot more complicated though. Okay, thanks. If you want to read more, we have a preprint on our five. <laughs>